There is a downside to how we teach jazz now. On one hand, it's very efficient and it helps us internalize important skills. But on the other hand, it's often so focused and not taught using real music that we don't learn how other people played, which would help us understand the music in a broader way and also teach us a lot of other important things at the same time. Now, there are a few guitars that I was not really aware of while I was learning and didn't discover until much later. The three guitars are sort of falling into their own period. So one that's mostly before bebop, one that's sort of right at the creation of bebop, and then one that definitely plays bebop. And weirdly enough, one of them is sort of like Van Halen. When I first became interested in jazz guitar, I was still studying mathematics at the University of Aarhus. And I was actually very lucky that I got some pretty solid recommendations from my classical guitar teacher at the time, Morten Scott. That meant that I was not only listening to Charlie Parker, who I just discovered, but also got some CDs with Charlie Christian and Wes Montgomery to sort of widen my horizon a bit. My favorite of that album was 7 Come 11, which is a typical swing riff composition. The main theme is really just a riff. It sounds like this. And I probably like this because it's very rhythmical, repetitive. It's easy to understand with that one phrase. So really that's just, of course, the same phrase twice. So... And then sort of an echo. And probably this appealed to me because it was easier to understand, it made more sense to me than some of the other tracks, which had really interesting phrases with, uh, for instance, this shifting dim run of uh, good enough to keep. Of course, that's not really that complicated, but it was pretty far away from Hendrix, Steve Ray Warren and Race Against the Machine, which is sort of where I was coming from. The solo from 7 Cover 11 actually is a great example of something that I really felt that I was missing later in my development. So in many ways, pretty simple. He's relying more on rhythm and not playing that many notes. And as I already showed you, then there are more complicated and dense phrases in Charlie Christian solos. But I really think that this lighter, more sparse playing is something that really helps you get the rhythms and that sound right. Also later when you start playing longer bebop lines. All these phrases where it's just a few or maybe even just one note that's interesting because of the rhythm. Stuff like... It's really strong rhythmical ideas and still solid material that will really help you develop your sense of rhythm and how to make some interesting rhythms in your solos. And it's really just A flat in one position. It's pretty simple to play. You can learn so much from checking this out and I've used it quite often with students. Charlie Christian was a huge influence on pretty much all of jazz guitar. And when I listen to him now, then I also really hear how Barney Kessel was influenced by him. I believe that they met at some point, but I'm not sure if that's true. Actually, if you do know, let me know about that in the comments. Let's check out another guitarist that is criminally overlooked. I guess sometimes when you work with really famous artists as a sideman, then you end up standing in the shadow of them and not really getting noticed. And I think that sort of happened to Oscar Moore, who's probably best known as the guitarist of Nat King Cole. Maybe a bit like George Martin, being the fifth Beatle, but of course hard to say how important he actually was. The Nat King Cole trio stuff with Oscar Moore is from the mid 40s until the beginning of the 50s. And since Nat King Cole was both an amazing musician and a commercial success, then a lot of the songs are short takes with a single or a half chorus of solo for the guitar. This makes them fairly easy to learn and Oscar Moore solos always have a lot of solid lines, but also some really interesting phrases. Check out this solo from Sweet Lorraine. So he starts out pretty simple. He's actually kind of just quoting the theme in the beginning and then he gets into some blues. And I feel that these shorter solos are really more similar to a solo that you might find in a pop or a rock song, which I guess this song also was when it was released in 1940 something. There's always a lot of blues in those phrases. But then he continues into this more intervallic phrase like, which is really just following the changes. Check this out. And then that becomes sort of the first part of uh, another intervallic phrase. So he's kind of using that as a motif, but it gets even more strange and more intervallic. So that's really just sort of playing around this shape, like... And then using a similar thing with some octaves on the A7. 
So it's really also about creating some surprising or flashy effects as much as playing a flowing melody like he started out. And I think that's really a part of the function of this solo also because, of course, it's just a short solo in the middle of a sort of very beautiful song. And I think this is something that kind of disappeared when jazz became more like serious art with bebop and the solo itself was what was important. Check out how he goes on to an arpeggio but then also still uses some tremolo picking and a lot of long slides. Now. It is really sort of in that way similar to what you might hear with Van Halen or Steve Vai, something like this. Not really a melody, just a bunch of sounds that sound impressive. And maybe I'm making this into a hot take by comparing Oscar Moore to Eddie Van Halen, but really I think this is something about this period of jazz, because it was actually something that was much more a part of jazz at this time. If you listen to Ellington's saxophone player Johnny Hodges, then I think you can hear a similar approach, where it's not only about the notes, it is as much about the phrasing and the effects and the sounds. <laughs> But keep in mind that I'm not really saying anything about whether this is good or bad. I'm just showing you an aspect of the playing that is sort of similar. You can, of course, get rid of your anger in the comment section if you think that I'm offending you by saying that Johnny Hodges and Van Halen kind of do the same thing. I really feel that I've learned a lot from how Oscar Moore mixes the different things in these short solos. And Nat King Cole is anyway fantastic, both as a piano player and as a vocalist. This solo actually always makes me happy and Grant Green is probably the one of the three that I ended up spending the most time on. Mainly because I've given his solos to pretty much all of my students for them to learn some bebop vocabulary. And that's also how I discovered this album and this solo on the Standards album. Which I think is a great example of how to play bebop on guitar. And it's probably there is no better place to learn bebop than Grand Green. His lines are absolutely incredibly melodic and his vocabulary is just solid bebop. And I'm saying that while I still don't like his tone on this album. But of course, you can complain about that in the comment section if you want to. First, check this out. So within these eight bars, you have so many great things to learn. Of course, this is of his solo on uh, I Remember April, which is off that Standards album. And there are some really great phrases like this one, which is on the C minor seven, and he's using the arpeggio from the third of the chord. So it's based off of the E flat major seven arpeggio. And of course, that's a really important concept to learn if you want to learn to play bebop. And actually in these eight bars, he's doing that quite a few times. So you have it on the C minor seven, but you also have it on the G seven where he's using the B diminished to get a G seven flat nine. And on the F seven, just to get like a regular uh, F seven with a nine, you have the A half diminished arpeggio. And with a few chromatic notes, then you also have an example of a pivot arpeggio on the B flat major seven, which is another important bebop concept to get in there. is then an example of how you take a line cliche and then turn that into a bebop line. Another thing that is also useful to learn. So you kind of have on the C minor F7, it's sort of turned into this kind of movement, but then in a melodic form. And of course, he's also adding some nice phrasing embellishments like sliding into notes, chromatic notes, and also some trills, and rounding the whole thing off with a blues phrase. And it is kind of mind-blowing that this is all within eight bars of a solo and there are actually several places in the solo that are just as good as this. Now, if you want to develop that sound of your playing, then he is definitely the one you want to check out, especially how he mastered adding pivot arpeggios and large interval skips to his playing and in that way not sounding like he's just running up and down scales. And there are a few techniques for this that you can start using. Four of the most common variations are all in the solo that I talk about in this video and that can really breathe new life into your bop vocabulary and give you some fresh melodic ideas. The solo is on another standard, namely the song You Stepped Out of a Dream. 